Welcome to everyone today. Thanks for joining our webinar. Um, I'm Matt Kasky, and today's webinar topic will be um, GeoPeer Rail Maintenance Solutions for Soft Roadbeds and Slope Instability. Um, and so those of you familiar with working in the rail industry um, have heard this many times, and the mantra is build it now and fix it later. And that's a good practice if you want to build things quickly, but it can also lead to maintenance problems later on, uh, particularly if the track was constructed over soft ground. And, and how many of you out there listening have received a call uh, from one of your customers related to soft ground or slope instability causing track alignment issues or, or ballast shoulder falling down the, down the slope or things like that. And during today's webinar, we'll describe two GeoPeer technologies that can be used by rail owners, contractors, and the design consultants uh, to help repair these track hazards. For soft roadbed conditions, uh, we'll describe our GeoPeer GeoSpike technology. And for slope instability along raised embankments, we'll talk about the GeoPeer slope reinforcement technology. And we'll begin the webinar by talking about the GeoSpike system, which is used to treat soft roadbeds. And those of us that work in the rail industry, you know, what we what we see on the right hand side it is a common problem. There, much of the rail infrastructure is in poor repair. Um, we have soft subgrade soils that are causing fouled ballast, mud fouled ballast, pumping track sections. Um, these things can lead to um, instability of the track line and ultimately if we have a situation like in the lower right hand corner uh, can eventually lead to a slow order for the train um, and that's a common problem and that's something that the rail industry cannot tolerate and we know that sh uh, ballast fouling can be caused by several mechanisms and, and one being abrasion of the aggregate particles due to dilation of the rock particles during dynamic loading Due to rail traffic and the, and the dust that's created during the um, during the process of particles rubbing next to its neighbors, though those just in themselves can lead to fouling of the ballast. But we also know that another mechanism of foul ballast is soft subgrade below the ballast section that can result in a couple of things. One being shallow progressive bearing capacity failures um, within the zone between the ballast and the and the original subgrade. And we can also result in ballast pockets that, that consist of soft soil mixed with ballast and rock particles, also uh, usually accompanied by a fair amount of water that form these ballast pockets that cause a lot of problems to the overlying track structure. And whether it's a ballast pocket or uh, the progressive lateral movement, uh, these issues often lead to poor performance of the ballast and maintenance issues are required to remediate those. Subtle signs of this can be seen during shoulder bulging um, from the progressive bearing capacity failures. These are these are sometimes um, overlooked or maybe even misdiagnosed uh, by infrastructure managers. Um, the the picture on the left and, and the, the bottom right. Uh, this is a track section that had been recently reballasted within the past three or four months, and it was uh, the opinion of the of the rail supervisor that this was just some some soil that had that had been um, left there. Uh, when in fact it was a surface expression of the sole bulges that we saw on the previous slide that were actually protruding through the side of the raised embankment. Um, the picture on the right shows a zoomed in version of it, but you can see that these things are often, um, they're, they're spaced uniformly along the track line and the result of the, the soft sole material squeezing laterally out from beside or from under uh, the ballast section. More obvious signs, you know, are, are seen commonly, deflection or, or buckling of the rail. Uh, those are easier to recognize um, and definitely can result in restrictions of rail traffic speeds, um, you know, usually ending up in slow orders. Uh, these have impacts throughout the connected networks uh, of, the, of the rail systems that these um, lines support. Uh, these delays are costly um, and require quick action to fix them. And many of these um, repair uh, solutions have been around for a while and many of them are costly and time consuming. Grounding is, is well established um, and accepted method. Um, it has some un uncertainties associated with it and some limitations. Um, while, while it works well in many cases, it can also uh, lead to some questions, you know, um, as, as the grout goes into the ground, is it treating the right areas? 
Um, is it going, you know, where the engineers and designers want it to go? Um, will that uh, grout, will it alter or maybe even restrict uh, the drainage patterns um, that the ballast section is, is designed to, to provide? You know, those in the rail industry know that um, the most important component of a properly functioning ballast section is that it has good drainage. Other methods um, are, are more uh, more robust. You could even remove the panel entirely, uh, remove the ballast and sub ballast section and, and perform a massive earthwork operation whereby you would remove the soft materials or the um, wet materials and, and replace those soils in place before you would have to go back in, replace sub ballast and ballast and eventually the rails. Um, but these are all very, very costly methods that have uh, significant impacts on um, the service life of that train and keeping things moving on time. And the GeoPeer GeoSpike system is a method um, that can also be used and in, in it's got a some definite benefits compared to the other alternatives, um, primarily that it can be installed without track, tie, or ballast removal and can be installed in place without massive earthwork or, or um, disruption of the existing rail line. Uh, these are these are polymer shells that are installed with the displacement mandrel that we'll see in the next few slides and they're installed between the ties and they're designed to penetrate through the soft poor performing soils and and tag into lower um, lower lying stronger subgrades uh, they, they represent a rigid load transfer to the stronger materials and we believe this is a fast and clean way uh, to perform subgrade maintenance for tracks Just some quick installation highlights here. Um, as we said, the mandrel is first inserted into the um, injection molded polymer shell. The mandrel and the shell are then driven between the rail ties as close as possible to the rail. And if you can see in the, in the, um, the cone on the top of the black shell section, it's wider than the body of the spike itself. And that is designed so that it will um, squeeze between the ties as it passes through um, the two ties and then re-expand as it reaches the bottom of that tie. After it re-expands it allows us to get better load transfer from the train and track down to the geospike element which will then transfer the loads down through the soil into a stronger bearing layer. After that geospike shell has been installed to the proper depth it'll be backfilled with aggregate and then the track will be re-ballasted and realigned as needed and uh, Reballasting will, will almost always be required, as you can see, there's a little bit of divoting uh, that occurs as this geospike is installed. Um, and realignment may or may not be required, depending on the uh, pre-installation condition of that track before the work begin. Next slide show a couple of views of, of how the system works in place. Um, you can see that the spikes themselves are going to be installed in pairs. Um, installed in pairs every other crib spacing. We want to install the spikes as close as possible to the rail itself to maximize load transfer from the from the rail to the geospike element. And they'll be driven so that the top of the geospike element, the flared apex top, is about 10 to 12 inches below the bottom of the rail tie. And, and that's done for two reasons. And the first reason um, those of you in the rail industry have probably figured out is that reballasting of tracks is, is common and it's, it's required in almost every situation. And the, re, and the undercutting tool uh, normally extends about 10 to 12 inches below the bottom of ties. So when the geospike top is set down about that deep, that allows future undercutting activities of the ballast to proceed unhindered um, and that undercutting process would not damage the top of the installed geospike element. The second reason that the geospike is set down 12 inches is so that we have efficient load arching through the ballast section to the top of the expanded um, geospike top. So we know that soil arching occurs as a function of the phi angle of soils and then granular soils, if we set that geospike top down about 12 inches, we get good efficient transfer from the train, through the rail, through the tie, through the ballast, down to the geospike top and down to the stronger subgrade materials. 
a couple, uh, just one slide on how we design uh, geospike systems for any particular project. And the, and the first step is to com compute the load from the train down through to the subgrounds. And unless conditions dictate otherwise, um, it's common to use traditional Cooper E80 loading, which which we've all seen before. Um, and that's usually used in, in to develop a, a load per foot um, equivalent load of about eight kips per foot. And if you're using a different uh, loading category, you would adjust these loads accordingly. Um, and after accounting for load transfer across those ties and some stress reduction that occurs through the ballast, you can develop the typical loading demand that you have to resist in the subgrade. And then the design capacity of the geospike is calculated just using traditional shaft friction methods and in bearing analyses. And so you can see that it's important for designers to understand the depth of the soft soil and the condition of the soft soil because you don't get much in bearing out of a six inch diameter uh, geospike element. Combine the friction and the in bearing and that gives you the capacity of the geospike element. The next video shows um, installation process on an actual project and we can see how this thing works in place. You can see this equipment is set up on high rail with the specially designed mandrel inserted inside the geospike and driven down to the proper length. Top of the spike is driven to about 10 to 12 inches below the bottom of ties, backfilled with aggregate. The mandrel is used to recompact and tighten up the aggregate at the top part and then filled to the appropriate depth and the geospike is there completed. These are installed in pairs near the rail lines as we discussed and every other crib to give you a completed geospike ground improvement solution for your rail problem. And we'll go to a case history where the geospike system was used for a railroad bay repair project um, north of the border in Ontario, Canada. Um, you can see it generally where this, this project was located. Um, on, on the left hand side of the slide and this was an area with the traditional problem of, of soft subgrade soils and pumping track sections and, and this rail owner had um, had a slow order in place where they had to reduce the speeds due to the track condition and this was this was negatively impacting their operations on this 180 foot section of track. Uh, section of track had been monitored for, for some time, but prior to the, the in installation of the geospike system, um, some shape array uh, monitoring had been done on this section to, mon to uh, try to get some precondition, uh, pre-installation, I should say, uh, conditions on how much deflection this section of track had actually achieved. And so um, if the slide is not coming through too clear on your end, we have displacement on the y-axis in millimeters, and, and the rail length, the length of the um, tested area is shown along the x-axis. And from the time that this thing was reballasted and realigned, which was about August of 2018, until March of 2019, when the final shape array survey was taken before the work was performed, um, this reballasted and realigned section of track had experienced an additional um, 70 millimeters or almost three inches of cumulative deflection that was occurring um, over due, due to the continued traffic of that line. And we were fortunate to get some geotechnical investigation associated with this. And you could see a, a portion of this boring log in this slide. And nothing really jumps out at first when, when you look at this until you start zooming in on the moisture content gradient um, at a depth of about um, five feet or so that the moisture content changes from about 10 percent which is clearly heavily influenced by some of the ballast to about 27 percent um, in a clay soil we know that that's not exactly the moisture content that that soil would like to be at and so that's probably a soft condition and, and is a indicator of, um, of the problem part of this subgrade and so clearly that is the zone that we need to penetrate with the geospike system and and tag these lower lying stronger materials at about seven feet. 
just a few more details about the design approach for this job. This was uh, Cooper E80 um, design loading, and that, that equated to about 16 kips per spike. Um, and that, as I said in the slide previous, that required geospike lengths ranging from about five to seven foot long. And, and so we had to use the HDPE extenders that I described a few slides ago. The spikes were installed in pairs at alternating tie spacings as shown in the upper right. And after the work was done um, in the area, the uh, rail maintenance contractor came behind and reballast and retamped uh, the divots and performed some realignment in the portions of the track that required that. And a lot going on in, in this slide, um, and, and we'll spend a minute here. Um, you know, the equipment was was not um, too unusual. This was a John Deere 225 excavator. Uh, due to access for this work area, uh, the contractor had to come in on high rail equipment, which um, for this job was exactly the right thing. High rail is not always required. And, and if an excavator can access the work area from the shoulder or from nearby roads, that, that is always permissible. But for this job, high rail was, was, the, right, was the right idea. And moving to the right hand side of the slide, you can see um, a, a better picture of the high rail mast. Um, and this is the special, specialty mandrel that was used for this and it is used for, for all geospike projects. Draw your attention to the collar at the upper portion of this picture and the beveled edges on the bottom of this driving collar. And these, these edges are beveled, as you can imagine, to align with the inside of the geospike apex. The bottom of the mandrel is open, and as you slide the geospike onto the mandrel, um, the collar engages the top of or uh, the bottom part of the of the geospike apex, and the bottom part of the mandrel will be set down on these driving plates that you can see positioned in place, and so that the spike itself is driven in place with action onto the driving plate, which protects the bottom of the geospike as it passes through the ballast and through the through the rail uh, between the rail ties and it's kept in compression with that driving collar so at no time is that geospike it should not be experiencing undue stress that might break it as we're driving all of the forces uh, from the vibratory hammer and from the crowd force of the excavator are sent directly to the driving plate with this uh, beveled collar holding the spike in place you can also see from this picture that we had the two foot HDPE extensions that were being held in place for this project with, with a simple PVC collar that allowed us to connect those to the geospike, geospike body itself. On this project as well, it was chosen to deliver aggregate to the geospikes with bags, and this was quarter inch chip rock. Um, bags are a, a perfectly fine way to deliver aggregate although new aggregate de de uh, delivery methods are currently being developed to make this a more efficient process. So we're moving to the bottom part of this slide and the setup is, is fairly simple. You set the mandrel um, into the geospike, drive it into place and use a simple temporary um, sonotube casing. And all this does is prevent ballast um, from between the ties from falling into the top of the apex as you're driving the geospike down to its design depth. Moving to the results that were that were generated, about a, um, a few more than 130 spikes were installed in just under two days. Um, and in fact, the, the work could have been performed in one day. Um, we outran the utility locate because things were moving so quickly. Uh, five to seven foot long geo spikes were needed for this job, backfilled with a quarter inch chip rock as we discussed. And, and one of the nice uh, benefits of this project was that the track was returned to service before the next scheduled train. So work was completed um, from early morning to mid-afternoon. Reballasting and retampling was 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 um, accomplished, and then the trains never knew we were there. Some back-end testing was performed and is currently being performed uh, to monitor the performance of the geospike system um, long term. Um, immediately after reballasting and then the, the train, uh, the line was put back into service, we had high speed optical equipment that was used to measure the rail and tie deflection uh, during the passing trains. And the laser um, has, was set at a distance so that the laser itself was not impacted 
um, by the, the ground motions associated with the train. Um, and we wanted to make sure that it was isolated. And we have a short video that shows um, this the train going by. And you can see that there's very little movement noted um, during the passing wheel loads. The laser, the green laser in the middle of that white picture is the, is the laser um, being projected from distance. And there's negligible deflections that were observed by the naked eye, of course, uh, which is good news. Um, the computer software uh, was used to reduce the data for actual measurements. And we can see the results of some of those on the next slides. Um, again, on this graph, uh, deflection is noted on the y-axis. And then you can see pre and post installation on the x-axis. And 60% and deflection uh, reduction was achieved after installing the geospike system for this section of track, uh, which is good news, which means that cumulative deflection um, will not happen as quickly. Um, local rail personnel, the, the local superintendent noted um, almost immediate improvement in what he described as the worst section of track that required frequent repairs. And we have further uh, monitoring that is being undertaken by Queen's University in Ontario. Uh, the, the shape array um, survey was reinstalled onto the onto the rail lines, and that is being continually monitored. And in fact, a, a full report of that of that information is in final review and should be ready shortly. Final slide on on the geospike system, um, just to kind of summarize what we've discussed so far. Uh, typically, geospike solutions are are 40% cheaper than traditional grouting approaches. And the installations can be quite fast. Uh, between 150 to 200 feet of track can be repaired per day. And that is certainly subject to the frequency of trains and how often um, the, the crews would have to clear the lines. Uh, but it does require minimal track closure time um, and minimal disruption to activities. We know that we can reduce tr uh, track deflections by, by up to 50 to 60%. And, and we know that if we can reinforce the subgrade below ballast and sub ballast. This is going to reduce the frequency and need for reballasting. You know, ballast is a is a finite resource, and and if, if rail owners can reduce the frequency that they need to replace that material, uh, that's good for for all parties for the long term. And so we talked about soft roadbed repair with GeoSpike, and we'll transition now to, to repairing slope instability issues with the GeoPeer slope reinforcement technology. And this is a slightly different um, hazard that, that rail owners have to face. Um, these are going to be embankment slope instabilities for raised embankments. It could manifest as, as lost ballast shoulder. Um, certainly, these can lead to, to track deformations and even track deformations that are severe enough uh, that might require subsequent geospike subgrade reinforcing. And, and all of these are used to remedy um, slow orders, which is the main problem for, for our class one and even short line rail owners. And these can occur for any number of different reasons. It could be uh, poor surface drainage. Um, you know, initial drainage features were, were set up and they may have become clogged. And when they become clogged, they don't function the way they're supposed to. And that can lead to um, water going down the embankment and causing these slope instabilities. Recent flooding can cause um, ditches to have high, higher waters than they were perhaps designed for. And rapid drawdown conditions can lead to slope instabilities at the toe of some raised embankments. Or, or perhaps the embankment itself was just constructed too steep to begin with, or perhaps the um, compaction efforts within that embankment were not appropriate. But regardless of, of what the cause of that might be, fixing these embankment instabilities quickly and, and cheaply is, is of paramount importance. And the basic concept of slope reinforcement technology is to divide the sliding mass into smaller increments and use each SRT plate pile to resist the lateral movement of each of those soil increments. And this is done by driving the plate pile through the unstable moving zone of soils and bearing it into the non-moving or stronger competent layer that's underlying it. Um, our design results in the, in the 
design spacing that is required to break the slide into smaller components of slide that can be resisted then by the lateral shear capacity of each designed plate pile. The transverse spacing up and down the slope is a function of the analysis that we'll talk about in a moment, and the horizontal spacing is, com is almost always a function of soil arching in fine grained soils. The next slide demonstrates the, um, kind of the, the, the visual um, of, of how soil arching occurs. This was a early research and development that was undertaken on, on the West Coast with, with the University of California, Berkeley. And when uh, this test zone of SRT improvement, when it was excavated below the final row, um, of plate piles, we did notice that there was some soil arching that occurred between those plate piles and we're able to measure that and determine that about two feet um, from the plate pile to the apex of the soil arch uh, was a common occurrence. And so that's uh, where a designer for an SRT system would come up with about four feet center and horizontal for fine grain soils. This spacing might be a little closer for a granular material, as those geotechnical engineers in the audience will know, um, it's common to see spacing range from, from maybe four feet to as close as three feet if the soils are more granular in nature. The next slide we can see um, some pictures of the plate piles themselves. On the, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that this is typical black steel um, it can be easily acquired locally. It can be galvanized or perhaps oversized if the soils in the, um, in the failed and sliding area are of a highly corrosive nature. The steel sections themselves are, are commonly available S shapes. And moving to the right hand part of the slide, the most typical plate pile section is going to be an S3 by 5.7. The plates are almost always going to be one foot wide. Um, quarter inch thick and then welded to the pile itself with just some fillet welds. And these are non-structural welds that are required to hold the plate onto the pile as it's being driven. The plate itself will vary in length from about three feet to about six feet. And then the length of the plate or the pile um, is a function of the depth of slide and the slope of the uh, work area and the overall compressibility or of the um, soils that we're penetrating. Plate pile systems are used for slope inclinations ranging from about uh, 45 degrees or one to one is about the steepest. Um, they can be used for, for slopes steeper than that, but that's more of a temporary stability application. Um, all the way down to three to one or even flatter slopes um, can be used with the plate pile technology. They're most effective for, for shallow slides, and we define shallow slides as those that are about um, 10 to 15 feet or shallower. Um, th there's been plenty of projects where these systems have been used for deeper slides, but 15 feet is usually um, the right spot for using a plate pile system. The piles themselves have to be bare, uh, they have to bear in an underlying stable soil and we have to get good penetration into that subgrade. Um, it is possible to drive these and secure them into soils that have rocks less than about three inches in diameter. And it's even possible to get them into softer rock like silt stone or weathered shales. Um, anything that can be drilled easily with a roller cone, a geotechnical bit can, can usually um, be, be, a, be used for plate pile systems. Um, normally not applicable for hard rock like limestone, anything that might have to be cored with a diamond tip barrel. Um, you would have a very, very strong um, uh, embedment and fixity of that plate pile, but it would be quite expensive. Um, and drilling into hard rock is usually not, um, not a good idea. We'll go over a couple slides on, on plate pile design. And, and the first step in any plate pile design is to determine the actual lateral capacity of the pile section itself. And those are designed by choosing a, a certain limiting lateral deflection. So the piles are designed for normally about one inch of lateral deflection when modeled um, 
in accordance with how it's going to be installed in the ground. So for this particular example, this is about a 10 foot plate pile uh, with about a five foot depth of slide. And so you can see that the uh, deflection curve starts to move at about five or six feet. And so if limiting that plate pile to one inch of lateral deflection, you can see from the slide on the right, that gives you a, a shearing force within that pile section of about one and a half kips at that limiting deflection. Now we don't always have to design them for one inch or less and if certain project conditions permit more lateral deflection you can imagine that you would get a little more shearing force out of each pile. Most typical applications will be designed for one inch and so the strength of each one of those uh, plate piles will then be used in the limit equilibrium analysis that you've set up. Like most of the geotechnical engineers that are listening in, um, all uh, we, we would design all SRT systems by starting with a limit equilibrium model with a factor of safety of 1.0 to determine the existing case um, soil conditions that led to the slope instability problem. And then with knowledge of the shearing resistance available from the L pile analysis, you would, you would uh, set up your model with enough plate piles at the proper spacing and with the proper number of rows to get the required factor of safety um, to, to resist the sliding working downhill. Design input requires four primary um, pieces of input that, that geotechnical engineers at GOP would need to use to develop a plate pile design. And the first is obviously the repair factor of safety. It's common uh, to use anything between 1.3 or 1.5, uh, depending on the project needs. Um, the slope inclination is, is an important feature, of course. The soil type and strength is important to know. Um, it's best if a geotechnical investigation is available or some type of soil information has been provided by the consultant so the designers have an idea of not just the type of soil that's in the that's in the embankment but also um, estimates of, of its shearing strength. It's also important to understand the fourth item there which is the depth of slide or depth of instability um, where the slide is occurring and that's a hard one to sometimes understand. Uh, many of these slides are in remote places where access is difficult or limited um, and getting a traditional geotechnical rig onto that slope is sometimes challenging and, and sometimes even uh, not possible. Uh, but the depth of slide or instability is an important feature to understand and that can be uh, accomplished sometimes by simply getting a hand auger. Um, just um, two men and, and a hand auger can do some investigations and make good geotechnical uh, judgments while while working on these slopes, or even something as simple as a backhoe. So one could excavate some small trenches within the slide on the failed mass and perhaps some um, handheld vein shear or pocket penetrometer devices can be used to get a good estimation of, of not just um, where the slide is, but also of what the in situ strength parameters are for this slide. This next slide will show a short video of SRT installations, and this is quite fast. You can see that this is um, traditional excavator mounted equipment, and this, this video shows a concrete breaker, which has a special bit that just sits on top of the plate pile itself, drives that plate pile in place to the proper depth, penetrating in to the stronger soils, and the plate itself is engaging the, the sliding mass. Similar to the, to the geospike system, the plate piles are also going to be set down about 12 inches below the existing ground surface. And, and that is done so that future um, lawn mowing or, or embankment maintenance can occur without having to um, adjust for the, the steel plate piles sticking out of the ground. These will be buried and, and will be um, no, no obstruction to future maintenance activities. And we have a case history uh, that, that we can look at to demonstrate how SRT systems can be used for rail applications. And this was a, a class one line in Eastern Tennessee. And this was an emergency repair that was used on a steep embankment. 
and this slope instability was causing some loss of the ballast shoulder along this line and was even leading to some track geometry defects. Um, it's about a 110 foot long scarp that was affecting uh, the rail line and this the sliding soils were extending down slope about 25 feet and this was also in a bit of a remote area uh, that was affecting rail operations and the owner needed a very quick response uh, from the GOPR team. And they got a very quick response. This one, um, they got about 100 plate piles installed in just, just over half a day and with minimal disruption to the rail traffic. And you can see from the picture on the right, um, the plate piles were installed from the shoulder of the work area. Um, th this was a, an app a site that had a little better access than the previous one we looked at and a smaller excavator was able to get in and access the work area without getting directly on the tracks. And it's interesting to point out this is similar equipment that is used to install the geospike system that we looked at previously in the webinar. Um, a normal sized excavator with a vibratory hammer, even though this one is a slightly different vibratory hammer, um, same type of equipment um, can be used to install the SRT plate piles in addition to the geospike systems. Because these are driven in place and are driven in situ, this had negligible impact on the slope vegetation and didn't require massive earthwork um, to come back in and restore this um, embankment instability. Last slide on um, for the SRT system, you know, we believe this represents a very cost-effective alternative to traditional earthwork repairs. Um, as we saw from the case history, uh, installations can be quite fast. Um, 100 to 200 plate piles can be installed per day. Again, that is dependent upon uh, site access and the rail traffic that is required along that line. Um, Minimal track closure times are required, and as we saw, this has almost negligible impact on the existing ground surface. An additional benefit of plate piles, because they're driven and buried, um, to, there is no wire mesh or um, any type of facade that is required to secure this slope repair method in place. Once you install the plate pile system, um, it is now going to work as designed. These won't have any effect on um, existing ballage drainage features. It's very simple to adjust the um, SRT spacing to accommodate any drains that might be going down slope, and they can also be adjusted to, uh, to miss any uh, trenches or things of that nature that are used to transport water away from the track and the ballast section. And like the geospike system, um, the idea is to restore strength back to the track section itself uh, in this case, to prevent a loss of ballast shoulder, and, and the ultimate goal is to extend the service life of the ballast and the track to reduce the frequency of ballasting and to preserve um, ballast as a resource in the industry. And that's the end of our slides. I want to thank you for your time today, and all of us at GEOPEER look forward to working with you again soon.